So it's great to be back in Helsinki. Nobody told me that the sun comes up at noon and sets at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, though, <laughs> at this time of year, right? It's a little... It come up at all. Oh, it doesn't come up at all. <laughs> you have a point. I didn't see it today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I want to talk to you about some ideas tonight that are driven by a problem. And here's the problem that drives these ideas. Uh, Fred Wilson, a VC investor in New York, says this. The more money you raise for your startup, the less likely you are to be successful. Is that why you came tonight, to hear this kind of news? Okay, now, question for you. Why might this be so, if Fred Wilson is right, why would he be right? Okay, take a couple of minutes, talk with a neighbor, come up with the top three reasons why he'd be right if he's right. Go. Okay, what have you got? Let, let's ask some of the gray-haired people in the room why this might be so. One reason why might this be true? One reason. The investors are a bit of a distraction. Yeah? Okay. Sucking up, is that a technical term? <laughs> Another gray-haired perspective. Too much money makes you lazy. Makes you lazy. As long as you are working without customers, you actually don't know what they want. Uh huh. Okay. So here's my take on it. I think those things are all true. I think too much money makes you lazy. It also makes you sloppy. Sometimes it makes you stupid. Right? Uh, second, plan A rarely works. But once you get a check for plan A, what does that do to you psychologically? You say, aha, plan A must be right because somebody just wrote me a check for plan A. And what does that somebody want me to do? Flawlessly implement plan A. But we know that plan A most of the time doesn't work. OK? So might it be wiser? to wait to raise money until you've actually got customer traction, OK? So hold that thought. That's where I'd like to go with you. OK. We probably wouldn't invest in Ali G's ice cream glove, right? But all too often, that's kind of what we look like when we come up with some goofball idea and go pitch it too early to investors. But the fact is, the vast majority of early stage and fast-growing companies never raise any venture capital. Those are the facts. Um, and I want to argue tonight that they shouldn't because it's a dangerous kind of thing to do. In fact, it's dangerous on both sides of the table. Okay? So let me uh, talk about some drawbacks here. Number one, if you raise money early, you're spending most of your time pitching your business to investors. Does that take a lot of your time, do you think? A lot of your time, right? How about starting the business? Does that take a lot of your time? Well, that needs time too. So if you're doing both of those things at the same time, one of them's going to suffer. Which one's going to suffer? The business is going to suffer, right? So it's a big distraction, number one. Number two, because the business is high risk, that maybe there's technology risk, there's certainly market risk if you have no customers yet, the investor is going to take a high stake in the business to compensate for that risk, not unreasonably so. Okay, uh, And that investment is also going to come with the shareholders agreement, a document that most entrepreneurs don't like very well. Okay, So it's not a good thing for the entrepreneur, but I would argue it's not very good for the investor either. First of all, that distraction before the check once you've raised check number one from investor number one, as soon as that check comes in, if you're the entrepreneur, to what does your attention turn? Where will I get check number two? So the distraction continues, right? It doesn't go away. Uh, the, the having a founder with too low a stake is not a good thing. The founder can lack commitment. And number three, all this baggage means that at some point objectives are going to misalign. So I don't think this current phenomenon that's sort of developed in the, in the ecosystem in which we live is a good thing. Okay. Now, let me show you some data. And this data might surprise you. This is data from the United States. 
that Josh Lerner at Harvard Business School collected. He got the return on investment data for every venture capital fund in the US from the beginning of the venture capital industry all the way through 2011, okay? And he simply plotted the return delivered by each of those funds, each of those funds on a graph. On this graph, it's a bunch of dots and then he drew a line through them. From the very best up at the upper left hand side funds that earned what? Just north of 700% return on investment every year for 10 years, the life of the fund. Was that a good fund? That was a good fund, right? We like to be investors in that fund, okay? So there were some good funds. Were there very many good funds? Not very many at that end of the uh, curve, as you can see. And then at the other end of the curve, there were funds that lost not some of the entrepreneurs or, or the investors' money, but actually lost all of it, right? Now, what jumps off the page at you here? What do you see? Number one, not very many of the funds earn good returns, right? That is quite clear. The vast majority are sort of lost in the middle, and in that middle, what kind of returns did they get? You might think that a venture capital fund would return, what, 20, 25% to its investors? Where's the 20 or 25% line on there, and what portion of the funds did that? One in 10? Not very good, guys, right? Did all the funds make money? No, they didn't. In fact, where does it cross the zero line? Around 25%. So one in four funds actually delivers no return at all, right? So this is really pretty bad performance, isn't it? If you got this, if you delivered this performance, would you keep your job very long? This is pretty tough news, isn't it? But there are a couple things that I think are particularly bad for the entrepreneur here. One is that these guys will write you a check, maybe, right? If you pitch them and they like your idea, just like Ali G, maybe they'll write you a check. But what will come along with that check is some assistance in helping you run your business. Let me ask you, would you like the assistance of the people who are delivering this performance to help you run your business? I'm not sure that I want that assistance, helping me run my business, right? If they can't run their business that well, I don't know if I want them helping run mine. And then third, even in these funds that deliver good returns, you know, 100, 200, 300, 700 percent returns, those returns got delivered because there was a Google or a Facebook or some real terrific company in that fund. The facts are that three out of four venture-backed companies do not return the capital that is invested into them. Three out of four. So you're playing a very difficult lottery game, even if you get into one of the good funds. So I ask, is this where we should be sending all of you with your great ideas for new ventures? I think maybe not. So you might say, okay, John, is there a choice? And there is. The choice is to get the customer, not the venture capital investor or the angel, but the customer to fund your business. And my research says there are five ways to do it, as you see here, okay? You can have a matchmaker model like uh, eBay or Airbnb. You just bring together buyers and sellers. It doesn't take much money because the matchmaker doesn't own the stuff that's bought and sold. So that doesn't take much money to build that. You can have a pay in advance model where you just get the customer to pay you before you deliver the goods, okay? Not as hard as it sounds. You can have a subscription model. We all subscribe to stuff, right? When do we pay for the subscription? In the beginning, right? Before we get the stuff, okay? Scarcity based model, some sellers don't try and sell as much as possible to everybody as possible. They limit what they sell. I'll talk about it in a minute. And then there are service to product models. Almost every service business is inherently a pay in advance business because we're used to paying in advance for services. But sometimes you can flip them into a product business and then scale it. So I'm going to give you some examples of each of these. 
But before I give you examples, I want to answer this question. Is there anything really new here? Okay? And the answer is no. This is not new, but it's been overlooked. So pay in advance models. When Michael Dell started Dell from his dorm room at the University of Texas, he got people to pay for the PC before they got the PC. And with that cash, he could go buy the parts. He could pay his buddies to assemble the parts and deliver the PC. Okay? It's not rocket science. Consultants do it. Architects do it. Most services business do it. Not rocket science to get pay in advance money. Okay. Matchmakers, eBay, Expedia, lots of examples. I'm going to tell you a, about a couple really current ones in a minute. Again, nothing new there. Subscription models, nothing new there. We've been subscribing to periodicals in print. We get Netflix, all those kind of things, right? Nothing new there. Scarcity, do you have a Zara store in Finland? I think you do, right? Why do people, sh who shops at Zara here? Do we have, you shop there. Why do you shop there? It's a good price, yeah? And if you see something you like at Zara, yeah. do you say, I'll wait a while and see if it's there when it goes on sale, or do you buy it now? What do you do? Well, actually, I'm a student, so I will wait for it when it's in F sale. Ah, yeah. And Zara typically doesn't have sales, right? No, they have. So if, if, if you don't buy it now, it's gone, right? So you got to buy it now. Zara's trained us, OK. And then service to product models, that's what Bill Gates and Paul Allen did. They were writing operating system software for the early PC makers, as you know, IBM and many others. And it was one service contract after another. And pretty soon they figured out, maybe we could just kind of systematize this and put it in a shrink wrap box and sell it, right? And that's when the value creation happened and when the business scaled. Okay. So I want to tell you just a few stories here of some very current entrepreneurs that are putting these models to work in what I think are pretty ingenious ways, ways that perhaps you guys could do as well. Okay. First example, company in India. You've never heard of this company. Most people in India haven't heard of this company, but it's the Intel inside of the travel industry in India. This guy, Vinay Gupta, in 2006 said, you know, the travel industry in India is going to change. There's a growing middle class, lots more money, discretionary travel is starting to happen, but travel agents don't do a very good job. If you can imagine where you'd get a, uh, an airline ticket, if you wanted to fly from your little city in India to Delhi maybe, where do you think you bought your ticket in 2006? Was it online? No. Where do you think you got it? And a travel agent, right? A mom and pop travel agent, right? Some small business had a travel agency. Well, guess what? They didn't have real-time ticketing capability. So you'd go to get a ticket to Delhi for next Wednesday. They'd say, come back tomorrow. I'll tell you when you can fly and how much it's going to cost. So Gupta said, if I could give them real-time ticketing capability, and if I could give them better commissions than the airlines are giving them, because they're all mom and pops with no power, I could build a nice business. So in two months, he signed up 170 travel agents in Mumbai and in, in, in uh, Bangalore and Chennai. And uh, here was the deal. The travel agent would give him a $5,000 rolling deposit against which they would issue tickets. So there was never any credit issue. Just $5,000 sitting there, keep topping it up. And in return, the travel agent would get better commissions and could issue tickets on the spot. Do the math, guys. 170 travel agents at $5,000 a piece. How much money has he got to start and grow the business? 850K. Does that go a long way in India in 2006? A long way. A long way, right? OK. Last year, VIA did half a billion dollars, US dollars, in sales, just its little slice of the tra travel transactions it facilitated. Today they're in Indonesia, Philippines, and India. Okay? Now, second one, matchmaker models. These two guys, don't know if you know their names, but uh, they started a business you probably know called Airbnb, right? Who stayed in an Airbnb property? Probably uh, almost everybody in the room, right? 
the origins of this are very interesting. These two guys were design students living in San Francisco and like many design students they were having trouble paying the rent. And there was a design uh, conference coming to town and they said well why don't we see if we can get some of the people at that conference to come sleep on our floor because there aren't enough hotel rooms in San Francisco to accommodate this big conference. They can sleep on our floor. We'll get a couple air mattresses. That was the air. We're going to feed them breakfast, so air, bed, and breakfast. And uh, maybe we'll kind of show them the, the sights of San Francisco too. So they started the business and that worked and they paid the rent that month. Then they said, well, let's do the next conference that's coming to town and so on. In 2008, they saw that the U.S. Democratic National Convention was going to be in Denver in 2008 when Barack Obama was nominated. They said, you know, that's our chance to get on the map. Denver has, a, has 100,000 people coming to town, but there are only 30,000 hotel rooms. They're going to need something like we offer. Could we go to Denver and get some attention and maybe put some uh, fuel in our business? So they went to Denver, hired a bunch of friends to sign up spare bedrooms and couches to surf on and so on. And then they did a couple quirky things. They said, we, gotta, we, we can do that on the supply side, but we have to get notice to build a demand. So how are we going to do that? So they, uh, they discovered that you can buy a couple of different kinds of American cereal in custom-made boxes. So this is a cereal called Cheerios. Some of you will know it. It's a round oat cereal. And they said, let's call them Obama O's, and we'll sell them for 50 bucks a box. So they bought a whole bunch of boxes of Cheerios, custom boxed Obama O's. They also bought a whole bunch of something called Captain Crunch and called it Captain McCain's. John McCain was the other candidate. <laughs> to the Democratic audience, the Captain Crunch, Captain McCain's didn't sell very well. So they ate that for breakfast for a very long time. But the Obama O's sold out. But the cool thing was this stunt got them an interview on CNN that went mm -hmm. national. Uh, the people at Y Combinator, Paul Graham in San Francisco, noticed and said, these guys look like they might be on t something interesting, brought them into Y Combinator, then venture capital followed from Jeff Bezos and others. Uh, they now have 800,000 properties in 192 countries. They've just raised some money at a 10 billion valuation. They've done pretty well, but where has the money come from? The money at the beginning all came from just their little slice of a transaction between somebody with a couch to surf on and somebody who wanted to surf on that couch. And these guys only had to build a website and, and get some buyers and sellers, okay? Customer money funded the business. Another Indian story. I don't know if you can see that cartoon there. Can you see that from the back? Maybe you can. Father says to kid, no, you can't outsource your homework to India, right? Um, Ganesh was in India in 2005, uh, was in the U.S. in 2005 and saw this cartoon that ran in the U.S. And he also saw a whole bunch of headlines in newspapers bemoaning the fact that American mathematics education isn't what it needs to be. We're losing to the Koreans, we're losing to Singapore, we've got to get better at math. Ganesh said, you know, in India we're pretty good at math. And we have a lot of teachers who are pretty good at teaching math. Could I somehow bring Indian teachers together with American teens who need help with their homework when their mom and dad are working and do that over the internet somehow? So he built a little WebEx interface, hired three teachers, put them in a little room in Bangalore, and they started helping these kids in the U.S. for 20 bucks an hour, $20 an hour to help the kid with the area of a trapezoid or whatever the problem is. Well, 20 bucks an hour turned out to be kind of awkward because the parent didn't know when the kid would need help. So he changed to it to, to a subscription model. And he said, okay, you can subscribe. It's 100 bucks a month and we'll give you, your kid all the help they want. It's now in any subject, not just math. And uh, very quickly, it became clear that the renewal rate on the trial subscriptions was north of 50 percent. Okay? Customer paying a hundred bucks a month in advance, kid getting some help, and when do you think the Indian teacher got paid? Later. 
Do you think the Indian teacher got paid very much? No, they did not, given the Indian wage levels. Rocket science business. The business grew, got sold to Pearson, the biggest education company in the world, six years later for north of 200 million. Funded again, how? At the beginning, by the customers' deposits for the subscriptions, you know, to help all this happen. Okay, now, one more. This guy, Grandjean in Paris, and his partners saw an opportunity in 2003, was it? 2001. They had been in the business of connecting the French fashion industry uh, who would occasionally make mistakes. They would buy too much fabric or make too much of a style, so they'd have closeouts. These guys would buy the closeouts and they'd run these underground sales in Paris to discreetly get rid of the closeouts without disrupting the brand. Nice little business. The internet came along and they said, gee, if we could do this online, we could serve a much wider market than just Paris and we could maybe grow the business. So they said, how about if we do this? We'll run sales, but they'll only last for three days. So we'll, we'll, we'll sell only to members. They have to log on to our site. The sale is good only three days. You say, yes, I want to buy it. So, so they, run a, they shoot a little video of somebody, a really nice model, wearing the clothes. These are closeouts, remember, the stuff that didn't sell. But on that model, they look pretty nice, right? They run the ad, three days, it's over. Then the customers all have already paid with their credit card, right? So they got the customer's money. Then they tell the vendor how many to ship. The vendor ships them. And then 60 days later, they pay the vendor. What do they do with that money for 60 days? They run some more ads, right? For some more closeouts from some more vendors. Grew the business very nicely organically until 2005, until they ran a lingerie event. And they got noticed. The lingerie event was their first in that category, and it got lots of headlines. Then they really began to grow, but the problem was everybody began to imitate them as well. Because if you think about it, Anybody can put up a site and sell somebody else's merchandise. It's not that hard to build a website today. So there were imitators all over Europe, imitators in North America, and it turns out this category these guys invented called flash sales, and I'm sure you have flash sales business here in Finland, turns out to be a really difficult category to actually make any money in. Yes, you get the customer's cash soon, so you can grow it fast, but making profits is another matter. What do you think the vendors do when all of these people are banging on your door who have started flash sales sites and want your closeouts? One thing they do is raise the price. The second thing they do is say, oh, we'll make some more. So they make some more. So it's no longer scarce and it's no longer really a value, right? And so the whole value proposition has gone away. So as I've studied these flash sales businesses, I've only found two that actually make any money. These guys still are profitable in France, but not elsewhere where they've grown. And there's a company in the US called Zulily that does it for kids and toddler wear. Um, everybody else seems to lose money at this business because it's very tough to actually make ends meet. Okay. And then lastly, two Scandinavians, two guys from Denmark, had an idea in 2003. They said, you know, the web should be a phenomenal advertising medium, but it's not working. Because banner ad click-through rates at the time were falling and really couldn't communicate much, much of, a, of a message. They said, we need a better way to use the internet for advertising. Could that be video? So they said, let's start a business. We'll call it Go Viral where we create, then host, video advertising, video content that is so cool that when somebody receives it, they will send it out to all their friends and it will go viral. So they, they found a company who would let them run a test. The test worked. They ran another test. It worked. Then Nissan launched a brand in, in Europe called the Qashqai. I don't know if anybody in the room drives a Qashqai. But Nissan wanted to hit a younger demographic with that automobile. Nissan is not exactly a youthful brand. And these guys convinced Nissan they were the way to do it. And that worked really well. So then they had a big company story to, to tell. 
Well, in 2005, YouTube launched. What do you think? Is that good news or bad news for these guys? Good news? Bad news? Turned out to be really good news. Why? It made online video cool, right? All of a sudden, everybody was into online video, but these guys were doing it systematically in a way that they could measure the results and make sure stuff went virally. And so they, with their history of doing this campaign for Nissan and some others they'd run at the same time, got on the stage at the Cannes Advertising Festival in southern France and told the story about how online advertising could work for ad agencies. Well, if you're a little company on stage at Cannes talking about the future of online video, you don't look like a little company. You look like a big company. It was a two and a half person company at the time. These two guys and a half a programmer. But that got them going. They started to grow really fast. 10 million Danish kroner, 20, 40, 60, 100 million. And then they sold it to AOL in uh, 2010 and sold it for nearly $100 million. All funded the entire growth by the customer's deposits paid up front to run and host and measure the ads. Okay? No venture capital ever went into the business. Okay, now, I've told you some examples. What do they have in common? A few things. Number one, they all have what I would call negative working capital. That is, they have more of the customer's money hanging around in the bank account than they need to pay their suppliers. And with that cash, they can then do things to help grow the business. That's the number one. Number two, all of them took essentially no capital to get started. Okay? They all got started on roughly zero, not sometimes precisely zero. The Airbnb guys did max out a couple of credit cards, but basically no capital to get started. Number three, when they did raise capital, they raised it not to start, but to grow. And because they were already customer funded, they had customers. And when you go raise capital and you have customers, you have a queue of VCs outside your door because they like risk reduced deals. Okay? And they raise money on much better terms. Now, I could tell you another story. It's a, it's a longer one and I won't do it because I want to save some time for Q&A here. But this is a business that was started in Barcelona in 2003 called budgetplaces.com. They rent one and two star hotels over the internet, little tiny hotels like the Pension Alberti there, whose picture you see. That Pension had no internet presence in 2003, of course, because the internet was new. These two people started this business, grew it organically, sold it in 2011 for 25 million euros, not as big a sale as some of the other stories I've just told you, but could you put 25 million euros to good use if you could do that in six or seven years? Wouldn't be too bad, right? Okay, so what about you guys? Which of these five models now could you put to work in your business? How many have an idea for a new business or are already in business here? Can I see show of hands? Okay, so some of you have. Which one of these could you use? Could you put a pay in advance model to work in your business? How about a matchmaker model, a subscription model, a scarcity model? All of them. <laughs> all at once? I don't know if you could do all at once. Yeah? Okay. So take a minute, talk with your neighbor. Which one could you put to work in your business? Go. Okay, so what do you think? Which ones did you choose? Anybody who could use the matchmaker model in your business? Could you bring together buyers and sellers without owning the goods? Yeah? Okay. Um, pay in advance? Who could ask for the money before you deliver the product? Who could do that? You could do that. You could do that. You could do that. Not that hard. You've got to have the right team, you've got to have the right product, you know, to ask for payment. And by the way, if they won't pay you in advance, 
is that news you might rather have earlier rather than later? Because if they won't pay you in advance, they might not pay you at all. You'd like to know that sooner, wouldn't you, rather than later? Yeah. Okay. So what should you do? Well, here's some things I think you shouldn't do. You first, you probably shouldn't prepare a 40-page business plan for your wonderful idea with a bunch of spreadsheets, all in support of the perfect plan A, which probably isn't going to take you where you want to go, right? We know that plan A most of the time doesn't work. So what maybe you should do is what Mark Suster says, another VC, ring the cash register. Go get a customer to write you a check. A check that clears, okay? But a check. Now, have I said it's easy? I haven't said it's easy, right? It's very hard. If you don't have the right product, if you're not the right person with a customer relationship, if you don't have the right team, it won't be easy, but it's way better than pandering to VCs, right? Now, have we seen both services and goods kind of businesses here? We have, right? We've seen B2B, we've seen B2C, okay? So you can't start every single kind of business this way. If you want to build a hydroelectric dam to produce electricity, you probably can't do this, right? If you want to build a biotech and discover a new compound, you probably can't do this. But for many, many kinds of businesses, you can do this. Okay, now, have I said angel or venture capital is bad? Have I said that? I haven't said that. What I've said is don't do it too early, okay? Once you've got customer funding and you're running, it's fine, but the timing worries me. It worries Mark Suster, it worries Mark, uh, Fred Wilson, and it should worry you. But once you've got customers and the business is actually working, that's then the time, I think, when you might say, now maybe I'll go get some venture capital and put some fuel in the tank and grow. Okay, now, one more thing. Could you get funded by one of the good ones? Remember we looked at that graph before. I want to show you what the rejection looks like in the US. Y Combinator rejected 97% of their applicants last year, okay? Angel List brings together angels and, and, and entrepreneurs rejected all but 1%. Andreessen Horowitz rejected all but 7 tenths of 1%. In fact, Mark Andreessen says today, my day job is learning how to say no to people without making them hate me. <laughs> okay? It's very hard to get this money. Might it be wiser and a better use of your time to spend that time with customers trying to get the customer to write you a check rather than getting an investor to do so. Okay. And if you can, isn't it vastly cheaper capital as well? Because if a customer just writes you a check for what you want to sell them, you haven't given away any equity. Okay. Now, final observation. Who in the room has written a business plan? I bet a lot of business plans have been written in this room, right? <laughs> Did you write those words in your business plan. We believe that blah, 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 blah. Doesn't work. You didn't write those words? They usually VCs ask for numbers. Oh, they want to see numbers, yeah. But the business plans I often see say, well, we believe that blah, 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 right? I want to translate what I think those words mean. I think what they mean is we've been so busy writing this business plan that we've had no time to go in and get any real data or numbers, but we fervently hope and pray that <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Okay? Now, um, there's a really good book on this topic, right? I've just scratched the surface. You, uh, there's some flyers over there. I can't carry books from London, so you have to go on Amazon or whatever to buy it. David Rose of the New York Angels says this is mandatory reading before you go raise any capital. Uh, it's on Kindle, it's on Amazon, all those kind of places, okay? In a nutshell, we all know that the customer is king, but I think what we have forgotten over the last 15 years is that the customer can be our venture capital investor too. And I hope they can do that for you. 
Okay, I would be happy to stop and take some questions. So, so when, when is the right time to get VC? Well, um, the guys at Go Viral decided that the best time to get VC was never, right? Okay, there's a whole lot of baggage that comes with VC. But they were able to do that because they had something that was proprietary. The technology was difficult to do what they were doing, to host these ads, measure them, make them go viral, all that stuff. So they didn't figure that they would be easily copied. So they could afford to kind of grow at their own rate, doubling every year, right? Not too bad, okay? In some businesses like Airbnbs, anybody could build that website. You could build that website, right? You could build that website and, and start doing that. So if you have a business where anybody can copy you and you may have to grow really fast, prove it works, and then maybe that's the time to put some fuel in the tank and go fast, okay? But you gotta prove it works by having customers. That's the notion, okay? In much of the world, early stage VC has gone to later stage because they don't like the risk, right? So that gap has been filled by angel investors. And angel investors often are willing to, to write a check for a plan, but not yet a prototype. Although the smart angels now are even, even moving a little later. In fact, they're taking ideas like these and saying, here, go put one of these five ideas to work, and when you have customers, come back and tell me, and then I'll help you grow, right? So it's, it's a real problem. It's really difficult to get early stage money in Finland, as you say, but not just in Finland, everywhere. And, and, and therefore, this is a much more sensible way to go. Yeah. Now, I pin you on one last question. It's probably going through some answer. Sure. We're having this chat over coffee. What's your thoughts on crowdfunding? Uh, it's a long story. I'm a skeptic about crowdfunding for a couple of reasons. Number one, it is pay in advance, right? So you, you get a bunch of money from the crowd, and then you, then you can use that. So that's all nice, right? One of my students raised the then largest ever crowdfunding route in, in London for a pizza business. Um, but I worry about it for several reasons. Number one, did you know that you have to bring your own crowd? That's how it works, okay? You gotta bring your own crowd. Most of the crowd, anyway. So that's kind of a lot of work. Uh, number two, the average amount raised for a crowdfunding campaign in the US last year was $1,500. Not very much money. And you have to do a lot of work to get that? You probably have to build a cool video. You gotta have maybe a prototype. You gotta find your crowd that you're gonna bring to this thing. So it's an awful lot of, a lot of work, you know. My student, Corrado Accordi, is very happy that he got the work that way, the money that way. But boy, it's a lot of work. And it's not necessarily indicative. The crowdfunding crowd that you bring and that funds your thing may not be your real customer. So even if you get that money that way, I'm not sure that's indicative that there's really going to be demand. I mean, it's money. It's fine. But I, I'm a skeptic, Peter. Yeah.